We're at Leap Country Park today for a little bit of Cold War heritage. You might already be aware of the bunker position that overlooks the Solent, but if you're not, it's a fascinating part of our history. It's called an ROC post, and this one in particular is the ROC 14 Group 46 post, also known as Stone Point. ROC stands for the Royal Observer Corps. They are a collection of part-time volunteers in peacetime. They were the UK's eyes and ears in preparation for a nuclear strike. There are 1,500 of these monitoring posts built across the UK from 1955 and on in the response to the threat of a nuclear war, and many times they'd be spaced out roughly eight miles apart. If you keep watching, because later on in the video you can see an interview I did with one of the guys who used to serve in this particular bunker. It might not look like much from above, but down that hatch there there's a long ladder which descends into a small two-room bunker, one room for operations, and then a small toilet and storage room. If the missiles did come, it was these guys who'd spring into action. It was their job to send out attack warnings, provide aircraft recognition services, gather data on the position and magnitude of bombs dropped, and then help to monitor any fallout activity. But in the early 1990s, the world had started to change. The Berlin Wall fell, the Soviet Union broke apart, and the threat of nuclear war receded so much that the decision was taken to close these monitoring posts down. As many of the posts were in secret locations and on private land, for example on farms and hilltops, they quickly fell into disrepair. Some were destroyed and filled in, others were vandalised and flooded, others were just simply left to rot. There's only a handful left surviving. I've personally managed to visit a couple of them, both in various states of decay. Some are better than others, as you can see from the footage I'm just overlaying at the moment of the visits I've made. Whilst all the ROC posts were built to the same design and template, the one at Leap here is very different because compared to the others that still remain around the UK, it's in an amazing condition. And inside, it actually still looks like it might have done in the 1960s. Now that's due to the fact that unlike other ROC posts, it's not hidden away in the countryside, it's not open to the elements, and it's not at the risk of vandalism. Instead, it's situated in a busy country park and benefited from national lottery funding in 2015 for a complete renovation. And if you're wondering, the periscope was added by Hampshire County Council to let people look down inside to see what it's like. It's also possible to go into it for tours and open days, but not at the moment because we're in a pandemic. But it's an amazing place, as I'm sure you'll agree. And I was actually privileged enough this week to talk to one of the ROC members who manned this position. His name is Stephen Hall. He was an ROC observer here from 1987 to 1991. And in the following interview, he tells me some great stories about his time in the Leap ROC post. I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed talking to him. <laughs> could argue we were actually quite an unusual post because most ROC posts were basically a bunch of old men yeah and uh, and and our one was we were kind of, and we won awards and stuff because of it we, we, we were rather unusual because we were all at the time under 30 right uh, you know in a bar um, there was one older guy um, uh, Mike Scott, who I'm still in contact with as well. He's down De Devon way now. And there was a oh, there was another guy, Roy something, who were older. But generally, we were we were a young bunch, and we even ended up with a couple of um, late teens, young women as well, which is even more unusual. Uh, and we also we one of the reasons people joined us too is um, some of the undergrads from the university had discovered that they could get cheap parachuting if they were a member of one of the uh, reserve right. uh, forces. And the ROC was about the most, uh, if you wanted to be in one of the reserves and have the minimum possible amount of hassle, <laughs> the ROC was actually quite a good one to be in because you know we didn't do square bashing and all that kind of weirdness. So they'd come along, do the absolute bare minimum they could get away with of uh, turning up at the post and then spend all weekend up at Nether Wallop or up yeah. or you know, somewhere like that leaping out of So was, was there a um, how did you become a volunteer? Was there an interview process or was there was, a qualifying? Yeah, yeah, there, 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 there was um, in fact there, there even used to be uh, I mean you, you know, this would have been way before your time but there used to be these public information films uh, I, I bet there's one you know, people collect these things and have them on YouTube, so it's probably still out there. But there used to be uh, in the seventies some really nice uh, public information films they'd show on the telly occasionally, uh, telling the nation about you know these are the people that are kind of keeping an eye on the sky, right? And all this kind of stuff. 
and you you know you'd see a bunch of uh, extremely well turned out ROC members in much neater uniforms than any of us ever used to actually wear. Uh, you know, with their polished shoes, patiently waiting by the machine, waiting for everything to go bang. <laughs> This is the sound of peace, but should the sound change to the warning of a nuclear attack, this man no, that's it. and 11,000 highly trained volunteers of the Royal Observer Corps will be on duty to handle the emergency. Look at the milk. That's no, fine. In the event of a nuclear attack on Britain, what could a man like Bill do? If anything was going to happen, I'd be on my way to this monitoring post, same as today, but there wouldn't be much time to take in the view. I, I had actually been quite active in CND and things like that for a while, and I quickly realised that actually, you know, no amount of screaming and yelling around Green and Common was ever going to make nuclear bombs go away. So um, maybe I'd better do something more useful with my spare time inside, uh, you know, instead. And that's what led me to joining the... Um, the, the ROC really, you know, I, I wanted to make a stand to do something, you know, I was, I was kind of anti-nuclear but not a kind of raving lefty or anything, you know, you know and I wanted to um, try and do something that made a practical difference and God forbid if, it, if the blue never had gone up, if it had only been a small nuclear attack, uh, the ROC might have been able to save a lot of yeah. lives. Um, I think all of us accepted that if it had ever been a large scale thing, there wasn't really anything. The ROC would have just made tallying the numbers of dead bodies easier. You know, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm aware of the one at Leap, mm. but I've never been in it because obviously the National Lottery, I think, funded to have it refurbished and it's very locked at the moment. Mm. But I have seen, I have been to two other posts in the past mm. in varying states of decay and vandalism. Yeah. And when you look at them, you, you, I kind of, I've always thought to myself, I don't really see, it doesn't look like it would be that protected in a nuclear strike. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. No, I, mean, the, I mean, the leap one, it, you know, it's quite deep. You know, you know that little shaft, it, it's quite a deep shaft. And, you know, unless the thing had gone off literally directly overhead, you know, it, it would have been quite a well protected. And they're, they're all built to the same spec as well, I assume, are they? They all look well, identical. They were, it's almost a prefabricated thing, really. Um, our main concern at Leap was actually that, first of all, you were right next to Forley, so there was always the yeah. assumption that, you know, surely that is a target, you know, that Forley's <laughs> got to be a target, you know, in, in, in a war. So you thought, well, we used to w worry about the, because the, the hatch itself, because there was only one way in and one way out of the yeah. post. And, you know, it's a metal hatch and a metal frame. And like I remember, it may well have been Steve Doyle in there, sort of saying, he said, oh, if there was an air burst overhead, it would weld the bloody thing shut, you know, you know. How would we even get out? So we had pickaxes and shovels down there. One of our, uh, part of our kind of contingency plan was on day one, you start digging the alternative, <laughs> alternative exit. Yeah. Because we, we, we weren't that convinced you'd even be able to get out of the main shaft. Um, and in fact, what you used to do with the posts is um, they, we used to call them clusters. You operated as three posts, yeah? So Leap was teamed with the one just outside Lindhurst, where right? it's in some fields uh, just on the outskirts of Lindhurst, and the other one was Stockbridge. So, so that was our three, our trio. And the idea was that, you know, in, a, in, a, in wartime, Although you were nominally attached, in our case, to LEAP, you could actually be sent to whichever of the three needed you. Yeah? So you used to do a fair amount of cross-training with the other two so that you knew, you know, knew the ropes of that particular post. And I think most of us used to feel that if it had actually been a real conflict, we'd have probably all laid it up to Stockbridge Post uh, because it was on the Chalk Ridge uh, you know, above Stockbridge, it was actually in a really good place. Um, it, it, it was probably the only one, certainly compared with Leap, it stood a sporting chance of surviving the first few days of the war. <laughs> and uh, the Lindhurst one wasn't too bad. Lindhurst would have probably survived. Did you ever? Were you aware of the one at Marchwood that closed in 1968? 
Yeah, we knew we knew it existed, but it, you know, it, it had been mothballed quite a long. Oh, okay. Quite quite a long time ago. I mean, I I, I dare say it could have probably been dragged back into use. One of the problems that, that we had, I mean, Leap's big problem was we we discovered after the war, uh, after the Cold War, uh, when when a lot of the Russian plans got released and we realised what the war plans had been. We, we discovered that um, the Solent would have been subjected to shallow water bursts. Uh, what they would have done is fired missiles into the Solent that went off, you know, in very shallow water and basically threw up thousands of tons of irradiated sand and shingle and crap. Wow. They would have then rained all over the, uh, the region. And uh, A, obviously killed a shed load of people, but also it would have, because it was a... Um, it would have thrown up all that debris, there would have been a lot of radiation. And it would have meant that the area around Southampton, Portsmouth would have been, you know, uninhabitable for years. And had we been in Lee, we'd have probably been flooded by the tsunami that the, the water bursts would cause, you know, because again, that was part of our concern was that if you did have a shallow water burst, the water would just pour down the hatch. Yeah, yeah fr- you know, and, you know, we'd have probably all got drowned inside our own. There's a there's a little boat. bit of drainage, isn't there, at the bottom of the hatch? But I can't imagine it would have been enough. It's not a lot, and you know, so you know, there there was, I think, almost an unwritten assumption that actually, if it had been a real conflict, um, once it had got to the stage where it might be about to go nuclear, we'd have probably all relocated to Stockbridge yeah. or Lindhurst because there was an assumption that Leap was in such a vulnerable so- spot. During your time, then, were there ever? Was there ever? How, how long were you serving for? How many years was it? Oh, I was only there from. I joined in the mid eighties yep. to stand down, so I only did about six years. Okay. There, there wasn't then, um, but what had happened back in uh, a couple of years before I joined, eighty three was the closest, uh, probably the closest after the. There were two points in the Cold War where it almost went live. Uh, one, of course, was the Cuban crisis, that's the one that everybody knows about. And the other one was, um, have you read about something called Abel Archer? No. 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 So we're, we're, we're Googling. I will make a note now. And, um, it was called uh, Abel Archer. Okay. It, it was a NATO exercise, uh, 1983, and it was right at that point where you had Reagan and Thatcher uh, you know, sort of talking about evil empire and all this kind of stuff. And basically what happened was Abel Archer was a massive NATO exercise in West Germany designed to practice how they would respond to, you know, a massed tank invasion by the Warsaw Pact forces uh, rolling into the West. What we didn't know at the time was that the Russians, uh, due to faulty intel, didn't believe Abel Archer was an exercise. They thought NATO was getting ready to invade. And apparently the Russians basically took all the safeties off everything and they were on a hair trigger ready to ready to respond. All the Royal Observer Corps posts I've seen from the Cold War era, mm. with exception to Leap, seem to be hidden, maybe on a bit of farmland, on top of a hill somewhere. You probably wouldn't know it was there. Yeah. But the Leap one is pretty much slap bang in the middle of a tourism area on top of the beach. That's right. I assume that I think yeah. the cafe was there at the time. Maybe it was the Nissan Hut Cafe. I don't know. Yeah, 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 the cafe was there with the public yeah. toilets and all the rest of it. And in your notes, you say about how sometimes people just be down at Leap, having a perfectly normal day, and then see you guys coming out of the hatch in all your gear. That's so right, yeah. could, just tell me a bit more about that because that just sounds fascinating. It was good because well, what used to happen was. Well, you'd have your weekly, there was obviously the weekly like drill nights or whatever. Um, so anyone who happened to be there on a, on a weekday evening uh, would have seen us going about our business, you know, you know, on weekday evenings where we'd be down like one evening a week, just checking everything's okay and doing our thing. But a couple of times a year, there'd be an actual exercise and we might be in the post for three or four days and we'd be in, a, in all the gear, <laughs> you know, so we'd have our, our anti-nuclear stuff on, Geiger counters and all this kind of thing. And there was one year, 
can't remember which one it was, uh, but there was one particular year where there was this one of these long weekend exercises on and coincided. I think it was um, it was either one of the Schneider Trophy reenactments or maybe a bank holiday weekend or something where there were way more than usual number of people. So instead of us, you know, getting up at whatever time and opening the hatch and going off and doing our stuff, they were like with all these hundreds of people in a completely full car park. <laughs> I would say at the same time as us kind of occasionally emerging out of the hatch, you know, opening the, uh, you had the, um, it's like a white drum that used to sit outside the uh, the post, uh, which was called the ground zero indicator. It was basically just a um, it was a drum with light sensitive paper inside and just a pinhole uh, on its side. It was meant to be a pinhole camera, and the way it worked was if if a bomb had gone off, the flash of light would get recorded on the light sensitive paper. We'd scuttle up, get the paper out the drum, put a fresh set in and then interpret the figures to read back to headquarters, say how high the bomb was, how far away, all this kind of stuff. It would be like reading, rather like the BBC weather report here, but yeah, you know, when they're going through, you know, 40 quality first, and it'd be very much like that. It would be sort of, you'd, you'd basically start reading off figures, and they would be the, uh, the bomb power indicator, the size of the fireball, the height above the ground, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And so the controllers at the other end at Winchester would be getting this all this info. So they'd get it from us, they'd get it from Stockbridge, they'd get it from Lee, they'd get it from all of the other posts in Hampshire. And they're basically triangulating all that data. And, and they're able to build a three-dimensional picture of, you know, imagining the airspace over Hampshire, how high had the bursts been, how far apart were they, what was the fireball radius? What was the blast radius? Which way is the fallout drifting? Has any of it fallen yet? When the people at Leap saw you emerging from your hatch, uh, did you ever get questioned as to what you were doing? Because I assume the whole thing was quite secretive. It had to be, didn't it? It was, but to be honest, because it was Leap, Hey, you know, you know, as you said, you know, you're right in the, bunch, in the middle of a bunch of tourists and you know, trying to have a nice day out. To be honest, what we used to do at Lee, which probably was completely against instructions, we used, we used to leave one of the observers at the top of the deck chair <laughs> and, um, just to answer the questions of the curious really? members of the public. So we'd have somebody sat up the top, you know, you know, literally with a thermos flask and a you know, cup of coffee, just to answer questions. Yeah. Because always people would come and say, well, what exactly are you lot doing? Yeah. This is the hatch opening. A bunch of people coming out looking like you know, aliens with gas masks and stuff, you know, you know taking measurements. And they sort of say, so what are you guys up to? And we, we'd explain. My God. Oh, well, it, that must have been such a shock for people because from, from what I know, the, the, the most of these ROC passes were secretive. The, the older guys would get it. Um, you'd get a lot of people who'd done national service. You know, and of course they, they, they knew about it. So anyone who was ex-forces, and places like Southampton, Portsmouth, you know, there's a lot of ex-forces people in the area. So the, the ex-forces people didn't bat an eyelid. They, they knew exactly what the ROC was and they, they understood the role. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of the public would be kind of, so what's this then? You know, so, oh, it's all right, we're just practicing World War Three, you know, they, 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 they'd sit there. I mean, to be honest, one, one of the things that did concern us, uh, and one of the reasons we we had our own contingency plan to go up to Stockbridge Post, <laughs> was we thought if there was a real conflict, um, I lived in North Battersley then, uh, and I was in Battersley, Steve Doyle was in uh, Holbury Hyde, uh, somewhere like that. Uh, Tim Leather was up in, um, he was like Bassett, uh, and Mike Scott was in, um, oh, Chandler's Ford, or like this. So, we, none of it, apart from old Doisty, there, there, there was nobody that could actually get to the post that fast. They were called up. And we always had this thing so, what do you do if you turn up at the post and there's a few families already? down there, you know, you know, you don't lob a grenade down there to get them out or anything, you know, this is Britain, not, not the Soviet Union, and, you know, 
people aren't stupid. Uh, you know, the good the good folk of Holbury and Hyde would have known. You know, enough of them would have known yeah. what that thing in Leap car park is, and put two and two together and figured out. And was was it just padlocks at the time? Was it just a- had huge padlocks at the time? You know, there was a massive, massive padlocks. Um, but there was always that element of. You know, realistically, are we even going to be able to get in there? Because the surely somebody will have commandeered this as their, yeah, you know, their survival plan. So, so you um, you couldn't really be secretive and leap, then, could you? No, no. no <laughs> were you meant to, were you meant to be secretive though? Were, were you were you allowed to tell your family and friends about what you were doing? Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, we all had to sign the official secrets act, but we were our status was uh, uniformed civilians, you know, other than. Um, Military personnel, although we all had RAF ID cards, you know, you know, we were given RAF ID cards. In World War II, uh, all of the all of the observers were sworn in as special constables at the outbreak at the outbreak of hostilities, so that they could be armed. And the the posts did carry, you know, they they did have sidearms and, and rifles uh, in World War II. So, although it hadn't been written into our, um, like, the rules or anything, if this ever becomes real, I'm sure the same thing will happen as happened in World War II. Yeah. And you will be issued with stuff, because otherwise, how are you going to defend the, the post? Yeah, exactly, you're exactly. exactly. People turning up, yeah. wanting your post, and you've got a job to do. You know, you know, you know, you know there's a military task that needs to be done first, and... Mm. Well, how much how much commitment did you need then? Because I, I I assume the post wasn't manned all the time, was it? No, it was no, just no. you. In, so in, how- in peacetime, we only went down there once a week, and uh, so so I can't remember what day of the week it was now. I think Tuesday or Wednesday nights or something. Yeah. Just to go down, and um, you just got you weren't paid in um, peacetime. You did if you were doing a, like a weekend exercise or something, they, they, they paid you. But uh, for the, the regular drill nights, you just got your travel and subsistence. You got paid your mileage, you know, for going to the post. And you probably got like a fiver or something out of pocket. Did, did you stay overnight on the bunk beds? Did you sleep in yeah. there? Yeah. yeah, we used to do that quite often, actually. Uh, in, in fact, I mean, we all had our own keys you know, to, to, to the post. So, um, or at least the observer and the chief did, and the chief and the leading observer did. So, uh, we, you know, it was very light touch management. You know, you know, we were basically that was your post. So you painted it, you decorated it. Uh, you know, you added your own home comforts. You know, you know, and, and, and such like. And in fact, we it was quite cosy for his post. You know, you know, we had it. Um, you know, that was pretty well sorted, and we we all had our own kit. Um, you know, better sleeping bags and the official. You know, the official issue stuff was the kind of old scratchy World War Two star blankets, and you know, those the bunks weren't comfy. You know, they they you know, they, they were hardly slumber down mattresses. But they did. Um, they did the job. Uh, I don't think any of us ever took the war gaming seriously enough to use the latrine inside the loo. You know, we, you know, we'd all uh, go down and use the one certainly, which itself would raise eyebrows and be. Were you, were you dressed in your um, nuclear outfits at the point? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, you'd wow. Be sort of wandering down, you know, sort of without the gas masks and stuff, you know, you know but you'd uh, you might sort of wander through in a, in, all, in all your kit, you know, to go down and use it. Well, I don't know. I I, th- I think all of us. I think all of us kind of. You know, all of these organisations. There's that kind of esprit de corps thing. You know, everybody has quite a pride in what they do, mm. and I think we were quite we were quite sort of proud of being members of the ROC, and we rather liked it, and we liked that there was something slightly secretive about it. You know, yeah. you know it give you a little bit of a. A grin, you know, so it's been in the step saying, you know, we're practicing Armageddon. In our case, we used to have, we genuinely used to use the post for most of the meetings, you know, you know, we quite liked it. If it was a really crappy winter's night, we'd meet up at the, um, we'd meet up in Hive at the uh, ATC uh, as a sort of place instead. So, so sometimes we'd meet at Hive. 
but for the most part we we'd use we, we did actually go down the post and called fish and chips out of the you know, chip shop in Holbury or something. I, I got very into the aircraft movement recognition side of it, which was a, a sort of a, a secondary role in the Corps. Um, because the primary role in the Cold War was the nuclear warning monitoring side. But one of the secondary roles of the ROC continued to be aircraft recognition. I still, I still have it, you probably can't read that, but it's... Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, I can make that out. First prize, yeah. aircraft yeah. recognition competition yeah. 1991. Yeah, that's Brilliant. the one. Yeah, that would be the last one of them, and that was the uh, when we used to compete against the uh, the LMK was the Danish equivalent of okay. the RMC. and so we used to go across to Denmark. You know, those of us on the UK equivalent yeah. Washington. The equipment that was in down in the in the ROC post. So, in the notes you sent me, you mentioned that you could have set an alarm off in the event of an attack, mm. and. Um, I mean, in the ROC posts I've seen, and I think they're the ones that might have closed maybe in the 60s, they seem to have hand crank alarms. Um, oh, I'm sure, yeah, yeah, is, yeah, is, yeah, is that yeah, the type yeah, you yeah. had? Because I'm thinking surely that wouldn't have actually really helped the local people. One of the problems because the, the standard alarm was the, yeah, you know, you've all seen those World War II films where you get that rising and falling tone of. Yeah. You will hear the attack sounds like this. It was a hand crank device to make that noise, and uh, there were two different designs. And we had one particular design down at Lee. And the idea was, if the air raid was coming in, you know, or the uh, bombs were coming, we supposed to say thing. We used to say, "Who's even going to hear it?" You know, you know, if we're down at Lee, what's the near? You know, Albury is the nearest place anybody actually lives. Uh, you know, nobody would have heard it. Yeah. But anyway, part of the job was that you were supposed to. So and it was like so many turns fast, so many turns slow, you know. And, you, and again, you'd have to you'd have to tell the local police when you were going to practice it, right? Because in in principle, somebody could hear it going off and sort of think, oh shit, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, this one it was the the one in Leap was portable, so um, but some of them in some of the posts were fixed, you know. You know, so um, so yeah, if you had the handle, yeah, you could, uh, <laughs> still do it. Hi, police. Yeah, you know, you know, you got to know them well, and we, we also the MOD police at um, uh, at the RAF Hive uh, uh, in as was. That's a fascinating place. I don't know if it's still there now, but next to where the RAF Hive, which is the thing that looks like a hangar in the, yeah. on the seabed, back in those days in the late eighties. It was a basically it was a NATO storage depot. Although it was called RAF, it was basically all US. It was all US, uh, and it was that was uh, yeah that was a fascinating spot. You know this big glory hole, uh, you know full of kit. And then when the Gulf War, first Gulf War, which was what that was ninety uh, one, was back in ninety one, and the whole area was just full of kit. Then, wow! You know, it was all being uh, shipped out. You know, from Marchwood, uh, you know, to be sailed as quickly as possible yeah. down to the Gulf War. Yeah. So people do something was that weeks in advance. Yeah. Because all these kind of armored vehicles were turning up, painted in desert colors. Uh, you know, parked up at Marchwood to be yeah. shipped off somewhere. And yeah. Go, mm, someone's uh, something's happening. Something here. is happening. Yeah. We we kind of did the job in the hope that we could do something useful. Yeah. And. If it had been a if it had been a limited nuclear exchange and then sense prevailed, we might have been able to do some some good. If it had been anything more than just a handful, uh, Britain such as a geographically small country, uh, by the time you've passed, you, you, you think just think how many targets there are in the south coast alone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, because obviously all the major towns are going to get one. Anyone with a port or harbour is going to get one. 
for all the military installations, the industry. You know, there there wouldn't have been many places on the south coast of, of England no. that weren't scorched earth and molten glass.